So we're at Zephyr Point. Here's Zephyr Point. Here's Lake Tahoe. And uh, we figured since we had a little extra time on our hands uh, that we would uh, kind of show you around Tahoe while also doing some, some Augie. So 90% on Augustine, 2% shameless plug for the Tahoe semester. We'd love to have you join us at some point. So here's Augustine. Some of you may be a little confused. Looks like James Harden. Uh, it's not James Harden. There's James Harden. Um, but I've heard Augie has a killer step back three. So we are going to be talking about the Confessions today. And the Confessions is one of my absolute favorite books. It is, I think, one of the richest books in all of Western um, Christianity. Uh, and it is a meaningful book to tons and tons of my colleagues, a lot of Christian scholars. But the problem is it can be just read as kind of a simple autobiography. And what I'm going to try to argue today and what I'm going to try to work with you on is understanding the confessions, not a simple autobiography, but an incredibly rich and complicated philosophical book uh, that is dealing with um, the central issue of how we, re how we relate to God and, um, and how time and memory uh, impact and shape that relationship. So what we're going to do today is we are going to be talking about Augustine on time and memory. So it's Confessions, books 10 and 11. So that's the topic. So the way we're going to approach this is the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to talk about a phenomenology of time. And that is simply a fancy philosophical way of saying, um, of asking the question, how do we experience time? Uh, and what we're going to focus on specifically is how Augustine, uh, in his context, would have been surrounded by contemporaries um, that were thinking about time in a particular way. So what are the inherited views from antiquity uh, that Augustine is responding to? And my argument is going to be, if we go through the Confessions, specifically books 10 and 11, that he's giving us a new and very novel way of thinking about time. So the next thing we're going to do is look at book 10, or book 11, I'm sorry. Um, We're going to try to figure out what Augustine's views are about time, and those are found in Book 11. The third thing we're going to do is we're going to look at Augie on memory, and we're going to go back to Book 10. So far be it from me to criticize one of the greatest thinkers in the uh, history of Western Christianity, but if I were editing the Confessions, I think I'd flip-flop those books. Uh, the time stuff helps make sense of the memory stuff. And so we're going to look at book 11 before we look at book 10. And then we're going to conclude by trying to give an overall characterization of the Odyssey, or, or sorry, of the uh, Freudian slip, of the, of the Confessions. So we're really going to, I'm going to try to portray the Confessions as a Christian Odyssey. And by Odyssey, I don't mean just any old journey I mean Odyssey in the Homeric sense. Uh, and the central question, arguably, of the, uh, of the Odyssey is, how do I get home? So when Augustine says in, at the very outset of the Confessions, like, my heart is restless, right? How do I, uh, you know, how do I find my rest in thee? I mean, that's another way of saying, how do I get home? Uh, and I think that's a pretty important question right now, but I think it's a way of characterizing um, the Odyssey. So that's the plan, right? We got four points, and we'll be booking around to various places around Lake Tahoe, and uh, yeah, hopefully that'll uh, that'll get us going. So let's do it. Before we start to investigate Augustine's views about time and memory, and I'm going to argue that those two books, 10 and 11, are the absolute key to the Confessions, let's talk about the phenomenology of time. 
and that is a fancy way of saying how do we experience time. So one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, poked fun at Augustine uh, by pointing out what he says in Book 11 about time, and Augustine says, um, I seem to know what time is until somebody asks me. So one of the places we can start with our investigation is just asking that question, start with our own tuitions. I mean, how do you experience time? What is time? How would you define it? For Augustine, he is going to put forward a conception of time that is going to differ radically uh, from his contemporaries. And my claim would be that you are far more Augustinian than Plato or Aristotle or the Stoics were um, because Augustine understands time as moving in a linear fashion. So if I ask you what is time, you would probably think of metaphors of like an arrow and you would think of time as moving in a particular direction. For Plato and Aristotle and most of the pre-Socratics, the Epicureans, the Stoics, they would have said that time moves in a secular fashion. And if you think about it, I mean, this is very counterintuitive for us, arguably because of the influence of Augustine, but if you think about it, thinking of time as moving in a cycle um, makes a good bit of sense. Um, the heavenly bodies seem to move in a cycle, the sun and the moon and our experience of life and death uh, and birth those things to, seem to move uh, cyclically. Even Thucydides thought that um, things moved in that kind of a cycle historically. Um, Herodotus says, why is it that when things become big, they fall? And so empires rise and empires fall. And so this cyclical way of thinking about time would have seemed very natural to anybody in antiquity. But for Augustine, because he is a Christian, he has to have a different conception of that. And the reason is that for Christians, the world has a beginning and it has a middle and it has a redemptive end. And there is a narrative, there is a plot flowing through that movement from the creation of the world, the redemption of the world, to uh, where time and everything else will be redeemed. And so for Augustine, he has to give arguments against a cyclical view of time. And so we're going to watch him deal with certain kinds of puzzles uh, that would have been well known in antiquity. But your view of time arguably has much more to do with Augustine's influence. Um, I think that probably most cultures of the world, um, it's more natural to see time as moving in a cycle and less natural to see it as a linear process. But if you have a God who creates the world, and who is ultimately going to redeem the world, um, you need a linear story. Okay, we are at point two. So we have talked a bit about the views in antiquity, uh, about the, the dominant would, view would have been um, seeing uh, time as cyclical, but what Augustine needs to have is a linear conception of time. Um, if you are going to have a Christian account of the creation of the world or the redemption of the world um, and everything that happens in between there, um, you're going to need a linear account of time. So Augustine is going to have to overcome some well-known puzzles uh, about time that would have been known uh, in antiquity. And these are basically skeptical puzzles, but in order for him to establish that we should understand time in a linear fashion, um, that we can make um, meaning out of the creation of the world, the Babylonian captivity, the incarnation, the resurrection, and the ultimate redemption of things, um, he's going to have to overcome these skeptical puzzles. So the first puzzle that was well known in antiquity is that time doesn't exist. And if you think about it, where's the future? I mean, it's a legitimate question, and time is like this. Um, we go through our day thinking we control it, we manipulate it, but the slightest reflection reveals we really have no idea what we're talking about. So where is the future? And correspondingly, Where's the past? Uh, is there some repository? Is there some sort of storehouse where the past goes? Um, we seem to be stuck in this bizarre existential situation of being 
in the now, but being unable to wrap that up and, and grasp that. Here's what Augustine says. Here's how he's going to respond to this first argument that there is no past and there is no future. To see what has no existence is impossible. And those who narrate past history would surely not be telling a true story if they did not discern events by their soul's insight. If the past were non-existent, it could not be discerned at all. Therefore, both future and past events exist. So here's the argument. You cannot discern which does, what does not exist. You can't think of what doesn't exist. I mean, try it at home. Try to think of something that doesn't exist. This is, we're not going to go into depth in this, but, but this is an important part of, of uh, the kinds of arguments that Augustine is going to make. They're going to become extremely important later when you encounter folks like Anselm and the ontological existence uh, for God. But he's not saying what we're discerning is something necessarily objective or outside of us or would exist if one weren't thinking about it. He's saying merely that at least future and past must exist because we can think about them. So they must have some sort of existence, no matter how attenuated or how subjective, there must be some kind of existence there. So the response to uh, puzzle one is to say you can't discern what doesn't exist. Okay? The second puzzle was that you can't measure what doesn't exist. And again, if Augustine is to have this linear account, right, this, this beautiful story of the creation and ultimate redemption of the world, he needs to have time understood in, uh, in a linear fashion. And you have to be able to measure. You have to say, well, the Babylonian captivity came before the resurrection of Christ. Um, so how does he respond to this argument? And this is, a, this is a crucial part of the argument here, too. So here's what he says. So it is in you, my mind, that I measure periods of time. Do not distract me. That is, do not allow yourself to be distracted by the hubbub of the impressions being made upon you. In you, I affirm, I measure periods of time. The impression which passing events make upon you abides when they are gone. That present consciousness is what I am measuring, not the stream of past events which have caused it. When I measure periods of time, that is what I'm actually measuring. Therefore, either this is what time is, or time is not what I am measuring. So, the response to the argument that says you can't measure time, Augustine's response is that what I'm measuring is a subjective impression. So hopefully you're getting the, <laughs> the uh, a, a fundamental part of his claim is that time isn't some objective field that we inhabit. It is not some sort of bowl that we're in or some kind of line um, metaphysically moving um, uh, through, uh, uh, through past um, and on to the future. Time is subjective. Um, and, and what he has in mind is something like this. I mean, you might say, well, listen, philosophy guy, you get your watch out and I'll get my watch out and we'll measure a minute. I mean, we could do that, but how do I know my minute is your minute? How am I to intersubjectively compare my experience of a minute with yours? So uh, what Augustine is saying is like, oh, I'm measuring something, but I'm, what I'm measuring is an impression within me. Right? I'm not measuring something out there. I'm not measuring some sort of field. And in saying so, Augustine is putting himself in league with um, contemporary Einsteinian views of time. Right? For Einstein, time is relative to the observer. There is no objective field called time. It is, object it is subjective and relative to the observer. And that's what Augustine's saying. And I think this is kind of surprising because you expect to, him to get to this point and you expect to, to say, well, if the creation of the world requires this unfolding story, then time must be some objective thing outside of us. On the contrary, what Augustine is saying at this point in the argument is that time is subjective and relative to us. So what we're going to look at now is how he goes further to characterize time. And he's going to give time a moral characterization. So really the question that we're going to turn to next is what is time for Augustine? How does he characterize it? So we have established that time for Augustine is subjective. But he's going to give us a further characterization of time, which is a key component of understanding Augustine view, Augustine's views on time. And what he's going to, what he's going to call time, or the way, the term he's going to use to characterize time, um, is extension. Uh, and the Latin is 
distentio. And the Latin term carries with it, it's not just a kind of a neutral term, um, but it carries with it a kind of moral quality um, of being fragmentary, of being broken, of being stretched out. Um, one of the ways of thinking about it is, is you're kind of squished out, you're, you're scattered, you're all over the place. So this is, this is what Augustine says, and, um, where, he, where he connects time um, to this notion of um, distentio. Let no man tell me that time is the movements of heavenly bodies. That would have been Aristotle's view. At a man's prayer, the sun stood still so that a battle could be carried through to victory. If the sun stopped, but time, um, the sun stopped, but time went on. That battle was fought and completed in its own space of time, such as was sufficient for it. So here's the key bit. I therefore see that time is some kind of extension. But do I really see that? Or do I imagine that I see you, light, and truth will show me? I mean, I love the dialectical quality of Augustine sort of putting these questions out there and second-guessing himself and praying for assistance and, you know, yelling at God that he wants to know about time and he's not going to be locked out of this. But he's putting on the table uh, a term that is incredibly important here because he's saying our subjective experience of time is not one of wholeness and fullness and ob objective goodness. It is a fallen state. It is a fragmentary state. It is to be squished out. It is to try to sit down and pray and then finding yourself thinking about cheesecake within five seconds. It is the inability to pay attention, to focus on one thing. And that is our state. Um, to be time bound uh, for Augustine is to be distended, is to be squished out. It is to be in the state of trying to gather myself but my mind is moving from past to future, briefly in the present, then it jumps to future again, and I am experiencing this stretched out, fragmentary state of being. And that's usually how we portray villains. Um, Voldemort is not the, the most uh, whole being. The Joker, not really all that connected and together. Um, fragmentary being is the way that we describe evil. evil. So here's what Augustine says. And I think that this, these are some of the most um, beautiful uh, <laughs> words of the confessions in the sense of characterizing the human condition in a pretty accurate way. Because your mercy is more than lives, see how my life is a distension in several directions. Your right hand upheld me. In my Lord, the Son of Man, who is mediator between you and the one and us, the many, who live in a multiplicity of distractions by many things, so that I might apprehend him in whom also I am apprehended. And leaving behind the old days, I might be gathered to follow the one, forgetting the past and moving not towards those future things which are transitory, but to the things which are before me, not stretched out in distraction, but extended in reach, not by being pulled apart, but by concentration. So I pursue the prize of the high calling, where I may hear the voice of praise and contemplate your delight, which neither comes nor goes. But now my years pass in groans, and you, Lord, are my consolation. You are my eternal Father. But I am scattered in times whose order I do not understand. The storms of incoherent events tear to pieces my thoughts, the endmost entrails of my soul, until the day when, purified and molten by the fire of your love, I flow together to merge into you. Distentio. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if more accurate words could be, uh, um, could be meditated upon um, during a pandemic. I mean, when has there been a time in your life when your future was more uncertain? Um, we're not sure what the next two months will look like. We can't do the things that we planned on doing. And I think that makes us feel acutely and poignantly what Augustine is saying the human condition is. It's to be scattered. It's to be stretched out. <laughs> um, I am torn to pieces, the inmost entrails of my soul, pulled apart. Um, and so time for Augustine leaves us in this state, not of simply some sort of 
you know, Einsteinian, oh, time's relative to the observer, it has a moral connotation. Um, we are not whole. Um, we are restless. We move back and forth between past and future. And we will only be whole when we are redeemed, when we meet our Lord and we are pulled together again. But for now, we exist in a state of distentio. So we've got this characterization of time uh, for Augustine as subjective, and he has further characterized it as a kind of stretching or a distended state, um, which carries with it um, moral implications. To be in that state is, is not a good state. Uh, but the other important characterization that we have to add to Augustine's picture of time is this notion of attentio. And if you think about it, like if you had no experience of the now, arguably there would be no way to distinguish past and future. And so Augustine is after this elusive experience that I think that we all have of being present, being in the moment. Um, so here's, here's, what, um, here's how Augustine describes attentio, but it is really the counterpart to distentio. Um, this is the thing that makes our experience of time possible. But how does this future, which does not yet exist, diminish or become consumed? Or how does the past, which now has no being, grow unless there are three processes in the mind, which is in this the active agent? For the mind expects, attends, remembers, so that what it expects passes through what has its attention to what it remembers. Who therefore can deny that the future does not yet exist, yet already in the mind there is an expectation of the future? Who can deny that the past does not now exist, yet there's still, there is still in the mind a memory of the past? None can deny that present time lacks any extension because it passes in a flash, yet attention is continuous, and it is through this that what will be present progresses towards being absent. So that's pretty complicated, but I think the basic point is this. We have this, these moments when we feel whole, when we are paying attention and we lose that sense of distentio, of being stretched out into time, and we pursue those things. Um, so a few examples. When we're done with this, we got a thousand feet of beautiful spring snow to ski. And if we get good turns, I can guarantee you I'm not thinking about producing Augustine lectures. I am completely wrapped up in the moment. I am whole, I am gathered, I am focused. And we love this flow. This is why we do things that bring about this flow. Um, and this is why we do things that give us, you know, kind of cheap attentio. I mean, the shortcut is drugs, alcohol, all kinds of illicit activities. And I think there's a, there's a good question to be asked, like why do people do those things? And arguably, they're after wholeness. They want to feel not distended into past, future, and present. They want to feel whole. They want to feel gathered. Um, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has made everything beautiful in its time, and he has placed eternity in our hearts. And as a Christian, I would say, as a Christian philosopher, I would say deep within beings made in the image of God is this image of eternity. But we can't quite wrap it up. We can't quite be in it. By the time we get to the W and now it's gone, but we still have this sense of the present and it arguably is what allows us to distinguish past from future. So let me give you one more example. Um, and this is, I think this is getting at some important aspects of Augustine's views about time and leads to views that he is later gonna double down on like predestination. Um, but I, I hope you can see how crucial um, the account of time is to Augustine's theological picture. So we started there this morning. That's Zephyr Point. So when I look at where we started, I can see the road we took. I can see the path that we took up to get to this peak. I can see the whole thing in one go. So there is a certain sense in which attentio gives you perspective. You see kind of the whole thing at one time. But while I was driving along the road, I was only seeing one little bit. It was like, well, I, I have a sense of where we started and where we're going to. It hasn't happened yet. Where did the past go? I am experiencing a kind of fragmentary state. I think is why we love to climb mountains because 
we get closer to that attentio. We get closer to that seeing the entire perspective. And, and Augustine later is going to go on to argue that's a God's eye view of the world. Um, so, so one way of thinking about being distended in time is that we're stretched out, but it's all happened already. It's all in one single instant, one moment for God. But we are experiencing it. We are experiencing our, our alienation from God as being, as being stretched out. So attentio is crucial, um, and it, com- it, it, it comprises this kind of opposition or this dialectic to being stretched out to if we pursue the path of attentio, um, then we can be made whole. But now we have to move to Augustine's views on memory, and that will further flesh out how attentio works relative to how the human mind works when it is engaged in memory. Augustine's talking about attentio, and one of the ways of thinking about attentio is it occurs when we do the things we love, when we're with the people we love, when we're doing the things that we love to do. So descending this, I wasn't thinking about coronavirus, I wasn't thinking about what I have to do, I wasn't thinking about my future, I wasn't thinking of my past. I was gathered, I was in one place, full and whole and attentive to what I was doing. And that's why the things that you like to do probably put you into that state. Whether it's crocheting, whether it's mountain biking, whether it's intellectual contemplation. But I think Augustine would always say there's cheap attentio. I mean, it's why we binge Netflix. It's why we drink too much. Because it's putting us into that state of attentio in a cheap and uh, shortcut way. So I think Augustine would say... Look for the things that uh, gather you up, that, for, that force you to, to pay attention. That's genuine attentio. All right, now we turn from Augustine's views on time to his views on memory. And I'm continuing the argument that these books, 10 and 11, Time and Memory, are absolutely essential to uh, understanding the confessions and figuring out what's going on and, and why Augustine would undertake this uh, autobiographical project. <clears throat> so at the opening of the confessions is, I think, where we get the key to why memory is going to be so important for Augustine. And to, uh, you know, rush right to the ending here, Augustine's answer to the question of how we know God and how we relate to God is memory. And I think that's a a counterintuitive notion. I mean, if I walked around APU's campus and I asked people, how do you think you relate to God? What's the fundamental way of relating to God? It probably wouldn't be, the answer probably would not be memory. So let's look at the beginning of the Confessions. Just happen to have it right here. And uh, I'm going to read you what I think is Augustine's statement of the problem. Grant me, Lord, to know and understand which comes first, to call upon you or to praise you, and whether knowing you precedes calling upon you. But who calls upon you when he does not know you? For an ignorant person might call upon someone else instead of the right one. But surely you may be called upon in prayer that you may be known. Yet how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? So what I think Augustine is doing here is restating another classical problem from antiquity about the nature of knowledge. So one of the ways of thinking about the confessions is it's an epistemological project. Like, how do we know God? How do we have knowledge of God? And the most famous problem in antiquity dealing with knowledge is 
Plato's statement in a work called the Mino, and this is sometimes referred to as Mino's Paradox. And here's, here's how it goes. So I'm going to set up Mino's Paradox for you, and then we're going to try to see that, I'm going to try to argue that that's what Augustine's doing. So here's Mino's Paradox. If you know something, you can't inquire into it. That's the first premise. Second premise is, if you don't know something, or if you don't have knowledge of X, then you can't inquire into it. So the conclusion is, whether you know, whether you have knowledge of something, or whether you don't have knowledge of it, either way, you can't inquire into it. So what Augustine is, seems to be saying here in the beginning of the Confessions is he's asking the question, how am I supposed to call upon God if I don't know who God is? But by the same token, if I knew who God was, why would I need to inquire? So the problem is a difficult one. And I think the problem is central to understanding Plato. I think an argument could be made that it's central to understanding Aristotle. Because how do we get knowledge off the ground? I mean, think about it. If somebody asked me right now to go find a, a hebity habity hoobity within three square miles of where I'm at, I mean... I don't know what that is. So it's hard to get that inquiry off the ground because I don't know what I'm looking for. But by the same token, think if you were, uh, if you were asked to inquire into your name. I mean, can you honestly ask and inquire what your name is? Probably not because you know it. Um, so the problem is one of inquiry and how we go about obtaining knowledge. And so what Augustine is saying and seems to be asking here at the outset of the Confessions, is how is it that I'm going to inquire into God? And he's asking an honest question here. And I think at the very outset of the Confessions, he's saying, if I knew you, I wouldn't need to inquire. But on the other hand, if I have no idea who you are, how am I supposed to know if I would hit upon you? How would I supposed to know if it's your voice that I hear? So for... The next section, we're going to look into how memory constitutes the answer to that question. And I think it'll help us see why he sets off on an autobiography. It's not just autobiography for the sake of autobiography. He's looking for the pattern of his life. He's looking for the pattern of the world. He's looking for God's redemptive hand and how that pattern is manifested in the world. And... But in order to do that, we're going to have to go deeper into what he says about the nature of memory. Okay, so the argument, my argument has been that the way into the confessions is to see this work as a response to Mino's paradox. So you can take that with a grain of salt. I wouldn't say that that's standard scholarly opinion, but it's been very helpful for me in trying to understand what's motivating the project of the confessions and more specifically how these key books um, 10 and 11 on time and memory fit in. So... There's no denying that Augustine's solution to, the, to Mino's paradox, uh, the problem of inquiry, is platonic. Um, I mean, Augustine is a, is a Christian Platonist. Um, however, I think that he's doing something interestingly different. Um, Plato famously solves Mino's paradox by characterizing knowledge as recollection, right? So um, he explains the way we know mathematical truths is clearly not through sense experience. Um, but we recall that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and the interangles of a, a square equal 360 degrees. Those are things that are recalled. Um, what Augustine has in mind is something similar to that, but I, th I think something that is um, different enough to, to try to get at and point out, because it's a distinctively Christian way of, of thinking about how one might um, respond to Mino's paradox and ultimately answer this question of how we know God. I think that's the question he's after. Like, how do we know God? Um, what is that um, epistemic relationship um, uh, 
uh, like? How, how are we to characterize it? So here's how he characterizes this idea of memory. And the idea that Augustine is going to put on the table is the way that we know God is through memory. Uh, and again, I think that is, uh, a, for contemporary Christians, that's incredibly counterintuitive. Um, I'm not sure that that's the answer. Uh, if you ask them, how, it, how do you know God? They would say, oh, clearly through memory. But we have to have an understanding of what Augustine means by memory, because it's not just mere recall. It's not just accessing the, the filing cabinet in our head. It's a, much, uh, it's a much broader notion. So he says, once again, they have to, they have to be brought together, uh, cogenda, so as to be capable of being known. That means they have to be gathered from their dispersed state. Hence is derived the word cogitate, to bring together, and he's, he's giving the Latin here, cogo, and to cogitate, cogito, are words related. So he is making the point that the word cogitate is related to the Latin word to gather. And that is key here, because what Augustine is saying is that memory is not simply recall. It is a kind of gathering. It is a kind of pulling together. So this is where I think Augustine is doing something that's importantly um, distinct from what Plato's doing. And this is um, his answer to how we know God, is we know God through memory. And this gives us the reason why he would write an autobiography. I mean, if you think about it, there is a certain sense in which it doesn't make a lot of sense for a Christian to produce um, arguably the first autobiography. I mean, we're supposed to be the turn the other cheekers and sacrifice for self. And here's a person writing about his life. But the key to why he's writing about his life is because he has the sense of memory as gathering. And so the reason Augustine is writing an autobiography is not simply to tell the world about himself. It is a deeply personal investigation because that's all he has access to. So if we go back to his ideas about time, we can't access the future. We can't access the present. All we have access is to the past. And so if we are going to relate to God, what we have is the data of the past. And so Augustine needs to access his past so that he can see the hand of God in his life. So Augustine, I think, is doing something very very um, countercultural, right? Most of us are Emersonian to the core. We think about the future all the time. And I think that that, Augustine would say, that has infected the way we think about our faith. We don't see a whole lot of value in the past. I mean, who reads that genealogy at the beginning of Matthew? But why would the New Testament start with a genealogy? Why would the, the biblical narrative um, constantly remind us to think about the past and this great cloud of witnesses that has preceded us. So Augustine's answer as to how he knows God is through memory because memory is mind. So what he means by this is something far more radical than, um, than the way we define the term memory. For him, memory is the mind. Memory is cogitation. Memory is thinking because it is, is gathering this fragmentary state that we exist in and trying to put it together and make some sense of it. And it's at this point that we can bring now the two books together, right? Books 10 and 11, we can bring his views of time and his views of memory together and put this business about a tentio together with memory. Because when I am thinking in the way that Augustine is thinking about his life and putting it together and going through the fine-grained details. It's not for some narcissistic purpose. It's not for him to broadcast his life. It's for him to understand who he is and see God's redemptive hand in history because memory is thinking. Uh, and so this notion of attentio, of paying attention to something, I think for Augustine, this could apply to all scholarship, whether you do physics, uh, whether you do sociology, whether you do kinesiology or business, you may not be looking at the data of the past, but what you're doing is engaging in this gathering process. You are pulling together. You exist in this fragmentary state. We all do. And so every form of scholarship is a form of gathering. It's taking the fragments of our existence and trying to put them together so that we can see God through the plot, 
through the narrative that is revealed by pulling together the fragments. And again, I think that's why he writes an autobiography. He's trying to ask the question, how do I relate to God? Um, one of my favorite Christian thinkers is Frederick Buechner, and Buechner was asked, you know, why do you believe in God? And he said, well, as a, as a novelist, I got into the habit of looking for plots. And then I started to see a plot in my own life. And then I started to see a plot to the world. And so one way of thinking about it is all scholars are looking for a plot. That does not mean they're creating plots in the way novelists are, but they're trying to, and this is where this distentio attentio dialectic comes into play, they're putting these things together. Um, I have spent countless hours uh, in wild places listening to students' uh, life stories because that's what we do. And it was honestly the, the part of the job that I was looking forward to the least, but it's part of the job that has become the most meaningful because when you watch someone gather, like even for a short little narration, what their life is about, they're doing what Augustine did. They're gathering the fragments of their life and they're saying, well, this is the plot. And I think in the process of doing that, it's not just an exercise for others to know you, it's for you to know you. It's for you to know how that hand has been working in your life and then how you will take your place in the world and, and what that um, larger plot is. So I'm going to end with the business on memory. Um, we're going to go back to, uh, we're going we're gonna to read some, uh, we're going to read some T.S. Eliot here uh, because the four quartets uh, are, they're an amazing, um, I think, Augustinian uh, way of framing the same problem. I think Eliot's after the same problem. How, how do I relate to God? How do I know? And I think he's giving um, in his poetry a, a distinct Augustinian type of answer. So uh, this is the quartet, one of the four uh, quartets um, called the Dry Savages. So it goes like this. Men's curiosity searches past and future and clings to that dimension. But to apprehend the point of intersection of the timeless with time is an occupation for the saint. No occupation either, but something given and taken in a lifetime's death in love, ardor, selflessness, and self-surrender. For most of us, there is only the unattended moment, the moment in and out of time, the distraction fit, lost in the shaft of sunlight, the wild time unseen, or the winter lightning, or the waterfall, or music heard so deeply that is not heard at all, but you are the music while the music lasts. These are only hints and guesses. Hints followed by guesses, and the rest is prayer, observation, discipline, thought, and action. The hint half guessed, the gift half understood is incarnation. Here the impossible union of spheres of existence is actual. Here the past and future are conquered and reconciled, where action, where otherwise movement of that which is only moved and has in it no source of movement, driven by demonic chthonic powers, and right action is freedom from past and future also. For most of us, this is the aim, never here to be realized, who are only undefeated because we have gone on trying. I think that's a distinctively Augustinian sentiment. He recognizes his distended and fragmentary state, and but he's going to go on trying. Um, he's going to, through memory, try to gather and pay attention to the past. Uh, and I think what Augustine is offering us is uh, a deeply countercultural way of uh, living the Christian life. Um, we tend to be incredibly focused on the future. Um, but if Augustine's right, um, if I'm right that memory and time are the key to the confessions, then I think the upshot is the past really matters, and it is a distinctively different way, um, and I think a, a very rich way of uh, thinking about living the Christian life. All right, here we are, back where we started. So this is point four. Uh, and I want to make the argument that Augustine's confessions um, can be seen as a kind of Christian odyssey. And that Augustine is, is really asking the question, how do we get home? Um, how does one's restless heart find its rest in thee? So I think that this is, is an incredibly important 
question. And I think that Augustine is a really good compadre to have in a pandemic uh, because he's asking uh, a question that is incredibly important. And he's asking a question that um, is going to be incredibly important for your generation. I mean, this event is going to mark your generation. Uh, what's going on globally um, will be indelibly um, marked upon um, who you guys are and who you'll become. And we're going to need leaders for families and churches and businesses and, uh, and uh, politics. And um, drilling down and thinking hard about that question, how do I find home, uh, will be an important one. Uh, we're going to go back to T.S. Eliot. Uh, I think, uh, as I said before, I think the four quartets are deeply Augustinian uh, and give us a way of characterizing what Augustine is trying to do. And I think uh, this particular section of, um, of one of Eliot's four quartets called Little Gidding, uh, this is one section of it, um, characterizes uh, what's going on in the Confessions extremely well. So, this is uh, Little Gidding 5. We shall not cease from exploration, and at the end of all our, of all our exploring, will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of the earth left to discover is that which was the beginning at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall and the children in the apple tree. Not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Quick now, here, now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. So, I hope uh, Augustine can be a good uh, traveling companion as you journey through very fluid and unknown conditions. So, Godspeed and stay safe.